Dear comrades, I welcome you to the second uh, round table of uh, today. This one titled uh, Toward a European Left Strategy of Building a Socialist uh, Alternative, which is also the last element of uh, this year's May Day School program. As the title of the round table uh, already tells you, we will, compared to the round table we had in the morning, uh, switch to a bit different uh, geopolitical uh, level of analysis, although the goal will stay the same that is to find concrete solutions to concrete problems uh, we are facing in our national struggles uh, to build socialism for the 21st uh, century, as Michael Lebowitz uh, would say. What we will take a topic about is the wider context in which these our uh, national struggles here on the Balkans are inscribed, about the ways uh, and also to, uh, the, about the degree to which the actually existing uh, left uh, political parties, for instance, uh, in, uh, uh, in France, uh, from the Gauche, in Germany, in the Link, and in Greece, uh, Syriza um, can present, how these parties can present a model as well as an ally uh, in these struggles, both on national and on international level. This is, of course, uh, the context of the European integration of its crisis and also of the relative electoral success these parties enjoy uh, um, in, their, in parts of Europe that are either uh, politically most advanced or economically most uh, exploited. I'm joined here uh, at the table by representatives of these left political parties and also by a comrade of mine from Initiativa za Demokratični Socialism, which is established during this May Day School. These are, from your left uh, to your right, uh, Christina Kainko from uh, Die Linke, uh, Luca Mesens from Delos Bankers Conversa and also from, uh, like I said, uh, from Initiativa za Demokratični Socialism. Uh, then Walter Bayer from Transform Europe, which is the uh, political platform of the party of the European left. Uh, then uh, uh, on his left uh, sits Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gautier from Espas, uh, Espa Marx and Parti Communiste uh, Francais. And finally we also have Gabriel uh, Sacleridis from Syriza. Uh, the discussion will take place in two rounds. Uh, first I will uh, ask my comrades here at the table some exploratory questions. And then I will open an open but not unregulated uh, discussion in which you, you uh, from the stands, will also have to participate. Uh, but in this, I hope that we will be able to avoid the kind of excess of uh, self-criticism which, uh, which, we which, which we had in the morning and which I believe is also, um, which is also characteristic uh, for the left as a whole uh, throughout its history. Uh, to, be, to put it differently, I hope that we will be will able to reach some kind of a Gramscian condition. Um, uh, a pessimism of the uh, uh, intellect, of course, but also a bit more of optimism of the will. And now I pose my first question to Christina. Uh, could you shortly uh, describe the architecture of the European integration and also how um, this architecture uh, influences the particular European uh, um, uh, European expression of the current crisis, and also what is the role of Germany uh, in this context? Yes, thank you very much. Let me say first, um, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, having this opportunity of the first summer days after a very long and cold Berlin winter, so this is really a pleasure. Um, and yeah, I will try to uh, answer your question, although I'm a little bit shy because I feel that you've heard of it so much about the European crisis during the last days, but I hope to sum it up so it's not boring. <laughs> um, so the Eurozone today has become a central battlefield of the crisis of neoliberal globalization. This is obvi pretty obvious. Um, looking at the ar architecture of Europe, um, we can see that it evolves, it evolves um, around a common current and um, is very much um, aimed at um, doing away with the possibility of um, devaluating one currency against the other and therefore um, and would by that having adjustments of, um, uh, of uh, different um, economic outcomes in the different economies. So the only adjustment mechanism left um, was bringing down labor standards and um, 
wages and competing out social standards and welfare as such. So it was a social democratic hope in this construction of, um, of Europe that the regional and structural, uh, and structural funds of the EU would generate an alignment between the very different economies inside the Eurozone. But um, we can see that the integration into the common market led to a differentiation and an inequality to, um, between all these regions, which was very much welcomed because it was uh, part of the opening up of the markets of those countries for the European, um, in the European periphery. <clears throat> so the European integration meant globalization and abolishing um, of national boundaries for trade and capital flows that used to protect the existing national industries. And the effect was a massive deindustrialization, um, mostly of Southern Europe, because of the low productivity, which could not be compensated by, uh, by low wages in these countries. Especially the combination of high productivity increases in Germany on the one hand side and the wage stagnation over the last 10 years um, put constant pressure on other European economies and Germany was by that kind of competing out southern European industries. So, um, uh, a perspective as a low-wage economy was a similar perspective for a low-wage economy in those countries was not so much possible because of the competition of the uh, rather even lower wage se um, sections in uh, outside Europe and the southeast um, in the southern southeast and other economies. So, um, sorry. Um, countries like Greece and Portugal had to accept massive and rising trade deficits and the means, um, this means that a government in these peripheral countries has no other choice um, but to boost low growth through state expenditure and private debt increases as we saw all over um, Europe and that was very much facilitated by a wave of cheap credits as we all know. So, um, the massive circle of capital flows from surplus countries like Germany, Netherlands, Austria to the poorer but growing countries in the peripheries was allegedly good for all sides. The consumption based on credit and speculation in the periphery was a necessary means for the German export boom, <coughs> thus stabilizing very low growth rates in Germany because the internal German market is very weak due to the stagnation of the wages since the year 2000. Um, this is, I don't know how how much this is known outside of Germany that there's this uh, massive low wage strategy in, being implemented into the German uh, wage market with the workfare reforms um, following the year 2000, which created the biggest low wage market uh, in Europe at that time and um, caused the drop in wages around 20 to 30 percent in uh, mostly um, service, service industries. and. Um, so the per unit costs or per unit wages in Germany dropped from the very top of the European scale to almost the end of the European scale over the last 10 years. So the um, wages in the core industry of export industry are still high, pretty high, but all the rest, like um, everything that was um, sublet or uh, that was outsourced, is uh, very much on the bottom of the, um, of the wage system. So, in this situation, <clears throat> um, the crisis and the austerity politics moved in. Um, so, in this situation um, of a financial attack, the so-called Troika, advisors from IMF, the European Commission and the European Central Bank forced the peripheral, peripheral countries, especially in foremost Greece, to organize something they called an inner devaluation. So, this is because um, a real currency devaluation is not possible because there's no more um, currency besides the euro. And in, inner devaluation means <coughs> that in a relatively poor country, um, the wages have to drop about 30%. But even this, in a situation of deflation and crisis, would not lead to increasing exports in these countries because of uh, the former deindustrialization and the low productivity. So the result at the moment is some kind of a circle of misery, <coughs> collapsing productions, rising unemployment, youth unemployment rates um, of about 60%. Um, all these uh, things you've heard about a lot, a lot during the last years. 
This also means drastic wage and pension cuts, longer work hours in public services, partial collapse of the public services, and most importantly, the health sector. More than half of a million evictions in Spain, throwing whole families into the streets, fast raised, rising charges for everyone from highway toll to medicine, higher taxes especially, value-added taxes, which pretty much uh, shows the class concept of this uh, new taxation. Um, of course, also the protest was, has been increasing and led to a huge social mobilization in most of the sectors of society, but um, there's not yet to see a uh, new concept of Europe emerging. How much do I have? Okay. So, um, I would like to uh, maybe sketch out a few questions that um, are problematic for left politics in Germany um, uh, yeah, for this backdrop of uh, the situation. That is, um, one is the, um, the that is hard to form a platform in this um, very uh, in these cleavages of, that are put into the working classes by this work for uh, regimes over the last 10 years. So we have this low wage market people um, have a very precarious sector and then we have the people in the core industries who are very much bound to the export, export strategy of the German government um, and there's, it's very hard to find a platform that is covering both of their interests. That is true as well for the protest movement that wasn't in, charge, uh, was in place for like one or two years, like the We Won't Pay For Your Prices movement, for example, as well as this for the left party or uh, the unions who try not too hard to in, uh, incorporate the precarious sector, but uh, at least the civil service union is uh, trying to come up with strategies not to um, double this, uh, this cleavages all over again. The next um, problem is um, it's difficult to uh, get rid of the ideolo ideology in everyday life that people think they pay for the rest of Europe. But in fact, it's the other way around, right? Like <laughs> the, the countries who are paying back their debts are basically paying back the loans that, or the investments of the German people or the German uh, pension fund, whatever. But, but it's still an everyday feeling that we are paying. So the, the government kind of succeeded in turning around the slogan of we won't pay for your crisis, which was um, a you know, critique of the elite and of those who gained from the crisis towards the European periphery and uh, building new, new cleavages and new cuts um, in, in the possible idea of solidarity of those who are affected by the crisis. And um, maybe the third difficulty is that it's kind of a backward um, well, the, the tale goes like this from the government. Because we had this work for reforms 10 years ago and we dropped the wages, Germany is better off than almost all countries in Europe. So this is why we were right. And this, you can see in the polls, is very much shared by a lot of people in everyday feelings. They say, okay, we didn't like it, we protested, but in the end it showed that Angela Merkel knew what is best for us all. So, um, and that is really hard to contest. I mean, not, not intellectually, but it's hard to get to um, and to build some kind of counter um, tail and counter job around around some things. Yeah, maybe I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Christina. And uh, now to Walter. Uh, do you think that uh, left could use uh, these uh, European institutions uh, for build building a socialist uh, uh, alternative? Uh, and if yes, under which uh, conditions? Um, well, thank you very much for this uh, very good question. Because actually, uh, if you start the discourse with uh, the question of socialism, it involves the question of capitalism, to which socialism is meant to be an alternative. And actually I find then that when talking about the European crisis, we ought to talk more about capitalism, not about countries or states, but about capitalism. Um, very often, uh, the austerity programs are presented as if they were badly informed uh, economic policies or if they were the uh, misuse of uh, orthodox neoclassical economies, which of course is true, but in the core of the 
problem of the euro crisis and the policies applied to cope with it by the ruling classes is a class project, a clearly identifiable class project, namely to do away with the welfare arrangements which were mostly achieved during, uh, during the period after the Second World War, which reflected the strength of the labor movement, of the trade unions, of the social movements, and uh, which now the ruling class feels uh, that there is a possibility to get into the offensive, do away with it, and bring back the working classes to a economic, social, and cultural level at which they were, maybe between the two wars, or even worse, as there is no competing uh, social system. So uh, that they feel there is a balance of forces which allows this. And the question now is, how is this done? How is this uh, class project um, executed? And of course, I can only point out uh, a, single, uh, a single aspect of it. Uh, if you uh, look um, at the European national states, you will find that um, between 40 and 50 percent of the gross domestic products in each of these uh, states is uh, centralized by the states and redistributed by the states and invested in welfare system, public services. At the same time, uh, you had uh, a development of transnational uh, capital uh, in the period, and particular dynamically during the 70s and the 80s and the 90s until today. You have the development of transnational financial markets, and on the European level, uh, you have a structure called the European Union, which actually uh, absorbs, uh, absorbs uh, not more than 1.2% of the gross national product. And when talking about the European Union, I would not look so much into the institutional arrangement. Uh, I would rather look at the construction as such and at the philosophy of this construction. And the philosophy of the construction is that welfare arrangements public services, uh, wage uh, arrangements take still place on the national level where at the same time these arrangements are embedded in a transnational structure which is uh, not um, so to say confronted or for which nothing comparable as the nation state exists. And this by the way uh, signifies the logic of the European Union. It's not uh, a defect in construction of the European Union. It's more than this. It's a sort of Hayekian utopia, namely to create a structure in which a permanent pressure is exercised on the nation states to reduce the state quota, while at the same time you create on the political level institutions and treaties which do not allow to expand the state quotas on the European level. And I think this is the, so to say, this is the, the, the problem with which we have to cope. And um, having in account the fact that transnational uh, markets exist, that transnational corporations exist, that transnational finance market exists, uh, I would say that the left and the labor movement needs a political space, needs, a, <coughs> needs political institutions on the, on the European level. And now there is this big disenchantment regarding the European Union. And I would say, disenchanted you can be if you were enchanted at a certain moment. But there never was a reason to be enchanted. It was always clear that the European Union is a space in which a political struggle takes place and in which different interests and among these, the most importantly, uh, class interests uh, are confronting uh, each other. So, when you ask me now, how does this relate uh, with the idea of a, of a socialist Europe? First, I would say, if socialism uh, was more than just an idea or, or, or just a dream, it has to grow out of the struggles 
and that means at the moment out of the struggle against the austerity policies and against the uh, authoritarian uh, uh, structures and tendencies uh, which are employed by the European Union to push through, to get, to get through with these policies. For example, uh, we are now as Transform uh, very much involved uh, in a project which is called uh, Ultra Summit, uh, which aims at, uh, it, it, it's carried up by 150 organizations, trade unions, indignados from TUC to ATAC, uh, including uh, political forces, aiming at not only uniting them, but at the same time to create a sort of political alternative which is based on the interests of the working populations in Europe, which means that there has to be a profound change in, uh, not only in uh, European Union politics, but also in the uh, institutions. So, finally, you ask me how these uh, institutions uh, could be employed in order to achieve social progress and uh, uh, a socialist uh, development in Europe. Uh, I translate this question. You could ask me, do you think that um, the European, I would not, as I said, look into the institutions, but I would look in the, in the, in the treaties. Are these treaties reformable? I doubt. I don't think so. I believe that what is, what now has to be done is to bring the present policies to a political defeat and by defeating these policies opening the path to a refoundation uh, of the uh, whole European uh, project. I would speak about the revolutionary refoundation. I would like uh, to remind ourselves uh, on one of the fundamental ideas which connected uh, the European left with the idea of uh, a joint European construction, namely the uh, Ventoteno Manifesto, which is very frequently quoted, it was written in, in notice, I, I assume, in 1941, um, authored, uh, amongst others, by the Italian communist at that time, uh, Alteo Spinelli, uh, who drew out of the war and of all these cruelties, the, the, the conclusion that the re-foundation of Europe is necessary. And I quote now from this manifesto, in order to respond to our needs, the European revolution must be socialist. That is, its goal must be the emancipation of the working classes and the realization of more human living conditions for them. And I think this holds true even for present days either uh, we can break the logic of uh, neoliberal capitalism, then there will be peace among the European nations, or we, we will be defeated, meaning that this neoliberalism prevails, which would mean that Europe will be broken, that uh, nationalism will again grow, but this would then mean that we are falling, falling back into a period of time which we hoped during the last decades having overcome. Obviously, there are still forces who want to go back to this, and I think the left and the socialist movement has to take up this challenge to oppose nationalism and at the same time to oppose uh, a destructive uh, European policy which actually um, nourishes uh, nationalism and um, uh, social um, catastrophe in large part of the continent. Thank you, Walter. And now to Luca. Uh, what is the impact of uh, European integration and also of its crisis on the economies of the European periphery? And what is, I mean, uh, as part of um, as part of this periphery, more and more, uh, uh, the solution from the perspective of the uh, Initiative as a Democratic Change Socialism. Thank you. Uh, I will try to explain that uh, by using the thesis by uh, Engelbert Stockhammer, a uh, British economist. He claims that neoliberal globalization uh, developed two different types of uh, develop development trajectories among the countries. 
On one side, we have the countries that are relying on export-oriented uh, development models, while on the other, we have countries that are relying on uh, credit-fueled development. Of course, these two types of economies are interrelated. Export-led economies produce, uh, ob obviously, um, uh, uh, current account surpluses and therefore need uh, deficit uh, economies on the other side, and vice versa, credit-fueled economies are dependent on credit flows from the uh, countries that produce surpluses. Now, what is interesting is that in global context, it seems that the core of the world system, that is uh, the USA, is relying on credit fueled development model, while the periphery, that is uh, the BRICS, are relying on export-led uh, uh, models. However, in the uh, case of EU, this world system perspectives kind of doubles and inverses at the same time. It seems that in case in EU, the core, that is Germany, Netherlands and so on, are export-oriented countries, while the periphery is more and more uh, pushed to some kind of dependent credit fueled development. Um, I would like to outline this uh, in uh, my presentation, uh, this historical formation of uh, this kind of division uh, in the European Union and uh, show its implications. Uh, my thesis, of course, is that it is uh, due to, um, to subordinate uh, integration of peripheral economies into the European Union. It came about uh, this kind of division between two different uh, development uh, models. So if I start uh, in the southern periphery, uh, the, this, um, uh, the Mediterranean members of the Eurozone, Greece, Spain and Portugal. All the three countries, as we know, emerged from right-wing or military dictatorships in 1970s and all of them cherished uh, huge hopes about joining the European Union. However, after the uh, accession came, uh, it soon turned out that it had negative effects on their economies. There were uh, two main reasons for that. Firstly, uh, accession to European com community disabled uh, tariff protection and therefore uh, brought about the loss of uh, capability to uh, protect uh, their, uh, their home uh, productive basis and uh, they lost uh, com com competitiveness uh, in, uh, rela in relation to the core countries like uh, Germany. And uh, secondly, what is uh, even more important is that regional development policies of the European uh, community do not uh, support uh, industrial development in the periphery. They, uh, they are focused at uh, infrastructural development. So on one hand we have erosion of industrial base because of accession, and on the other hand we do not have fiscal transfers that would um, that uh, would help to rebuild or something. Uh, uh, the in industries, they are just rebuilding infrastructure. Uh, so the, the obvious consequence of this is uh, the industrialization of the periphery that even deepened in uh, later years uh, on one hand because of the already mentioned uh, by uh, uh, Christina German wage deflation um, and uh, even more because uh, all the three countries joined the uh, European, uh, the, um, the Eurozone and they uh, gave away uh, also their capabilities to use monetary policies as protective tools. So what happened is due to loss to the competitiveness uh, uh, in the single market, these states relied their growth more and more on credit fueled development models. Foreign borrowing became the generator of the growth and most of the credits were pumped in unproductive sectors. They usually financed real estate bubbles and consumption. Uh, and the ultimate result of these processes escalated uh, in the crisis. Uh, the, the countries uh, uh, became dependent on uh, capital flows and as soon as they dried out in the crisis, uh, we, we saw what happened and uh, they accumulated huge budget deficits and the rising level of external debt. Now if we um, move to the East, uh, a lot of uh, the trajectories of the East was al already explained uh, in the panel on Sunday, so I will just outline the main points. Uh, the main point is that um, um, development in East followed similar, though not identical patterns as in the South. Uh, uh, and um, the deindustrialization here 
uh, was overlapping into <coughs> two processes: the transformation from capitalism to the, from socialism to capitalism, and by uh, subordinated uh, integration of those countries to European integrations. So, in Visegrad countries, as uh, Joachim explained uh, uh, bigger on Sunday. Uh, industrial development and financialization were uh, tightly related because both industrial base and uh, banking sector came uh, under control of foreign capital. They become uh, dependent on uh, uh, Germany and uh, in particular on uh, German exporting sector. So it was a very fragile uh, development. Uh, in the Baltic countries and in the southeastern Europe, the patterns were more like in uh, already mentioned uh, Greece, Spain and Portugal. These countries pretty soon adopted very rigid monetary regimes that were the center pillar of their uh, accumulation regimes. Uh, their strategy of uh, that policy was that um, countries uh, were trying to attract as much as foreign investment as possible, and so capital inflows obviously became the main, the main generators of uh, the growth in those countries. And the consequences were, were similar than uh, in other peripheral countries. Credits inflated real estate bubbles uh, and uh, boosted consumption. Um, and similar to Spain, Greece, and Portugal, uh, this had a disastrous effect on uh, in industrial sectors and ultimately resulted in uh, current account deficits and accumulating external debt. Uh, so, if I come to summing up, as we see, uh, the patterns appeared, similar patterns appeared in all peripheral countries. Both peripheries, uh, south and uh, east, were de-industrialized de in the last 25 years. Southern periphery mostly because of the loss of its competitiveness uh, to the core countries after joining the EU and Eurozone, while the eastern periphery because, partly because of transition and uh, partly because of uh, uh, um, also subordinate integration to European economy. Uh, the ultimate result in all countries was that they all turned towards dependent credit-led fi financialization. And this process has created a so-called Europe of two, of two speeds, as we often hear in the media. And what underlies this notion that Europe has two different speeds is that um, it created two different development trajectories. Export-led um, uh, economies in the center and credit fueled in the periphery. The reason for that is its architecture, its single market, its rigid currency policies uh, that enabled the old members, uh, that is the core, um, uh, to export their way out of the crisis of stagnation they experienced in the 1990s and uh, early 2000s. Uh, but of course for uh, devastating cost. The cost was the industrialization of the new members that were forced to shift their development towards dependent credit uh, fueled growth. Now, if I have a minute, I will just uh, put a notion of, uh, about uh, social strategy. Um, uh, if uh, my analysis is correct, so if uh, uh, development trajectories in uh, periphery uh, are the consequence of European integration, uh, its architecture and so on, uh, the logical uh, conclusion would be that what is to be done in periphery is to step out both from Eurozone and from, uh, and from uh, European Union. However, this strategy faces some uh, obstacles. Um, as we know, uh, capital would probably flee, flee the country, uh, exit would probably encourage speculative attacks uh, from financial markets, EU, European Union could uh, outlaw the country, and so on. So there is a huge danger that uh, if a left in government would, uh, would exit, uh, it would uh, be probably quickly destabilized and reposed from office uh, if, if, they, if it decides um, for that strategy. That is why I would propose um, another uh, alternative. I think that left should redefine its goals. It, uh, it is uh, necessary, of course, to construct some kind of uh, better development model in periphery, but I think it should not be done immediately uh, um, for whatever costs. Uh, I think that if a left somewhere in, in Europe, especially in periphery, comes to power, uh, it should focus mainly to stay in power and to, to export uh, its uh, revolution out throughout the Europe. After all, uh, I mean, I, mean uh, I, I don't have time to explain now, I can explain this in debate, but my point is that um, 
socialism in one country is uh, very improbable, and as Walter pointed out, we shall never forget that the conflict that manifests as uh, described Europe of two, two speeds is not generated by uh, German or Dutch or French peoples. Uh, such trajectories are generated as consequence of dynamic of capitalism and conducted by European ruling classes, and those, uh, these should be our targets. And now to Elizabeth, um, uh, how much uh, space to maneuver to the uh, European integration leave to, to individual governments? And also, I mean, to be more concrete, uh, an even tougher question. What would the Front de Gauche, uh, uh, the, pa uh, the party of which your party is also part of, uh, do if it wins the next elections? Thank you for inviting me and uh, to give the floor and to put these kind of questions. Just one thing, uh, Front de Gauche is not a party, it's an alliance of parties. Uh, and, and also, citizen participation, uh, people, they are not a member in, uh, in the party. So it's a, it's a innovation uh, in a complicated way, but it's the, it's the only way to do, to do this in this moment. Now, yes, uh, of course, the European project is a fundamental crisis. Yes, better like this? Yeah. Um, economically, socially, and politically. And I would like to insist on this point. Uh, the very neoliberal foundations of the European un Union, uh, con corresponding to the, f to the present financial market capitalism, have proved uh, to be wrong. Uh, and there is no answer uh, in the predominant way today. So we need breaks. We need, we need political alternatives, and we need to invent a left strategy uh, to change Europe. And this is a very new thing, uh, and I will try to insist on this. Uh, first, uh, we have to measure the deepness of the political crisis. Uh, uh, here, a lot of things were said on the economic and also the social crisis, but the political crisis is also now very uh, real in a lot of countries. Uh, just to give some some uh, flash in order to to uh, make this uh, uh, very visible, we have in a number of member states extreme xenophobic rights. Uh, they get stronger and stronger again. They are not marginalized in the societies, they are very frequently in the center of the political system. We have traditional rights and extreme rights which become ideologically closer and when we had for a long time in many countries barriers between the traditional right and the extreme right, sometimes these barriers now are breaking down and this uh, gives very dangerous alliances between uh, these forces. Uh, let's take it as example Hungary. Uh, we have also situations as in Italy where the parliamentarian system implodes. Uh, we have also on the, uh, what we call the left, <laughs> but now it becomes difficult to call this the left, but we have a very deep crisis of the European social democracy. Uh, as example, we can give the results of the Spanish PSOE. We can also take Portugal. We can take the PASOK in Greece, where it's really very spectacular. Uh, and sometimes these uh, social democratic parties came back, back in power uh, since people uh, try to change something. It's the case in France. But without changing policy. Now we have one year after Hollande's election, there is no change of policies. And there is no change of discourse, and this is very dangerous, because uh, there is the proof for a lot of people that there is no alternative, uh, and the Social Democratic Party helps this kind of, of, of feeling. So, uh, in the same time, we have uh, uh, new situations as in Greece, where the last elections uh, in June last year can be considered as a rupture of the political system, uh, and in a positive way, it's not always the case, but here it's in a positive way, since uh, uh, with the left and dynamic, uh, Syriza could uh, create really a new uh, situation, uh, uh, creating a kind of, of uh, uh, yes, dynamic between social and political uh, left uh, movements. Uh, in general, we can see that in Europe, very important social movements take place. 
um, but in a very difficult uh, balance of forces. We have on the one hand a lot of uh, very uh, big angel resistance, all what we can feel in our societies and sometimes with important expressions uh, as you know also in your country. And at the same time there is a big feeling of powerless, pow pow powerlessness. No? Powerlessness. So uh, they are mentioned as the, the first uh, transnational uh, European strike uh, uh, last uh, November 14th uh, with the um, uh, mobilization uh, namely in the southern European countries uh, and we feel that in the European uh, trade union uh, confederation there are big uh, tensions now between the trade unions from the northern countries, from the southern countries and so on, from, uh, from trade unions they want to fight and other they, they don't want to, to go too far in the contestation of the system. So there are new situations and of course we need new uh, political experiences, new political constructions. There are a lot of tentatives now to have new political constructions. Uh, it's the case with Syriza, it's the case with Bloco in Portugal, it's the case with the, uh, uh, red and green in, in Denmark, it's the case with Front de Gauche in France. So these are uh, new kind of alliances, more than this, fronts. So we, we, we tried to overcome the, f the, the atomization of the left forces, which is the heritage in, in Europe uh, since 89. Uh, and also we have European spaces uh, with the European Left Party, with the, the parliamentarian group in the GUE and GL in the European Parliament. And we as Transform, we, we try to be also a not network, not only a foundation. And with our magazine and with our newsletter, we try to help to, to, to come out a political left space. But what is a left strategy in Europe? Uh, and this is very difficult to, 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 uh, to build and to, to invent since Europe is a multipolar power structure. Uh, we have to organize the class struggle uh, in the same time on the national and on the European <coughs> level. And it's very difficult since uh, the political expression, the, the spaces for uh, popular sovereignty are on the national level. And they are going down at the national level since the Troika and other forces <laughs> make their diktat and, and uh, push uh, the, 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 the power of the parliaments uh, down. So we have um, to fight for a new kind of uh, popular sovereignty in Europe on the national and on the European level. Uh, and it means that we have to reinforce all the democratic forms existing. Social democracy, economic democracy, parliamentary democracy, direct or participative or transformation democracy. Um, and this is um, uh, always uh, on the two levels, on the national and on the European level. Since we have European institutions and we have uh, European um, uh, power structures. And this is the reason we should think on all the levers we can use to change things. Uh, all the levers we have uh, with new alliances between trade unions, between left forces, with, with movements, intellectuals, in order to try to, to, to move all the, uh, to use all the levers we can have, uh, if possible in the same way and if possible in the same time. Just an example, last year in the summer, if the situation had been uh, real, it was not real, but it could, that in the same time in Syriza became first force in Greece, in France uh, Front de Gauche was higher, could be higher, and so the Social Democrats could not be, uh, alone decide on the policies in our country. In the same time, in the Netherlands, uh, the Parti Socialist, which is a, a left party, could be first uh, party, was what, not the case, but it was a possibility. <coughs> In such a situation, we can imagine that we have new kind of levels in Europe to work together. And if we had such a situation, of course, what could we do? First, we have to try to, to obtain such situations. And then in France, the Front de Gauche was proposing for such a situation to try to build a European initiative, Etat Généraux. You understand this word? Uh, general um, states, uh, it comes from the French Revolution. 
uh, with the popular initiatives and so on, in order to refound Europe, and in order to try to find all the possible alliates in Europe in, to go in this sense. It's a kind of disobedience. It's not to be conformed to the European uh, construction today. So uh, it's in the sense to go to a new treaty with a new pact for another development, more development, development model in Europe. And of course with very concrete steps. Uh, I could give a long list, but let's say suspend the fiscal pact and the authority programs. Uh, disconnect uh, the financial sector of the public budget, uh, reform the European Central Bank, uh, uh, make a selective debt reduction for the over-indebted countries, uh, strict regulation on the banking sector, and so on. Social Europe with upwards directed uh, harmonization, cooperation in Europe and not uh, competitivity uh, without uh, any uh, uh, restriction. And uh, of course, uh, an investment, a new kind of investment in the national and European economic uh, recovery program with a new kind of develop uh, development. It's not a traditional uh, one we want. And all this uh, is not so Impossible since a lot of voices now uh, try to, to, to go in this sense. There are voices for a new deal in Europe, uh, very important economists as Alietta and so on say this. The, the German uh, Trade Union and Confederation, DGB, uh, is calling for a Marshall Plan for the southern countries, for Europe. And we try to write a manifesto of the peoples, which will be uh, presented in the in the Alta Summit in Athens uh, in uh, one month. So we try to build the, the foundations for refounding Europe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Now to Gabriel. Uh, what would Syriza do, or, which is also uh, an alliance of parties very much like uh, Front de Gaulle Gauche in uh, France, what would Syriza do if it wins the next elections regarding the European integration? To be more, more concrete, would it uh, stay or exit the European Union and uh, the Eurozone? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate in such an interesting uh, event. And uh, second, Secondary, thank you very much for the interesting question because it's a hot topic. Uh, it used to be uh, a hot topic in Greece. There was a very big discussion concerning this issue. And uh, I suppose that there are a lot of people uh, all over Europe who have the same uh, thoughts about and doubts probably about what is the appropriate strategy. So uh, let me summarize the argument. Uh, that we hear very often, we, you, we used to hear very often in Greece and we keep uh, listening to it actually. So the argument goes as follows, there is nothing to expect as long as we are a member of the Eurozone, which is a reactionary uh, monetary union. National sovereignty is cartelled in such a context, therefore no progressive policies uh, can be undertaken from a left government. Therefore Greece should exit the Eurozone so that it can devalue on its uh, new currency, increase its exports, okay, and impose capital controls and apply autonomous monetary policy uh, outside uh, the European system of central banks. This is the argument. Uh, we are not in favor of such a strategy for several reasons, reasons that I will try to uh, present them to you. Uh, first of all, there are two basic economic reasons before I proceed to the political reasons. Uh, First of all, we have to remember one thing that also Christina mentioned at the beginning, that the basic pillar of the current austerity strategy is the so-called internal devaluation, meaning that since there is no possibility of devaluing on the nominal exchange rate to gain in competitiveness, what a country should do is to diminish wage and dismantle uh, employment protection so that the unit labor cost falls. Uh, this is a devaluation in real terms and it is actually a strategy to increase exports and uh, restore capital profitability. Uh, a currency devaluation following an exit from the Eurozone and adopting a national currency has exactly the same effect. It diminishes real wages, 
to higher inflation rate and decreases labor cost, thus restoring again capital profitability. The common effect of the two strategies is that they, in both cases, and this is very important, we have a regressive redistribution of income from the poorest to the wealthiest people in the society. Another economic reason has to do with the illusion uh, that the country may have autonomous monetary policy. Uh, assume, for example, that Greece exits the Eurozone. Uh, the immediate outcome will be a rapid evaluation of the currency, meaning that the Greek central bank will have to intervene by skyrocketing the interest rates with detrimental effect on growth. That means that austerity would be again the case, but this time in a national currency context. So th this, the last one, brings me to the first political conclusion. Exiting the Eurozone does not mean either that the left government has more degrees of freedom, nor that austerity will end. Uh, what, we think is important in uh, what we think is important in such a debate is that it is possible to have austerity either within or outside the Eurozone. That means that it's not the currency that guides the policy, it's the architecture within the current currency operates. Uh, therefore, the target should be Eurozone's architecture itself and not the Euro as a currency. A second political issue, though, which I think is very important as well, is that imagine, for example, that Greece leaves the Eurozone. Uh, that means that it, it, we would advise our Slovenian comrades or our Portuguese or the Spanish comrades to do the same. And what would that, uh, what would that mean eventually? Uh, we should all engage in a currency war through devaluations in order to become more competitive. So we would put the Portuguese and the Slovenian workers against the Greek workers, and vice versa, of course, through a, dub, through a dubbing, not in nominal wages, as it happens now, but through a dubbing in real wages through currency devaluation. Uh, the point is that exiting, the exit in the Eurozone strategy uh, encompasses the value of competition among the European people, uh, where, whereas the left, the left, should try to put forward a strategy uh, to foster solidarity. Uh, let me say a few more things. Uh, okay, uh, in our view, the basic problem concerning this uh, option, this strategy, uh, li doesn't lie in the supposed the radical nature of the strategy, but on the contrary, in the fact that it fails to challenge deeply enough prevailing views about the nature of the Greek predicament. Uh, in this way, it is also unable to break with, with ruling ideas concerning the importance of the national economy and competitiveness. Uh, the serious economic and social consequences of breaking off from the Euro uh, are to be met with, presumably, in rapid succession, capital controls, controls nationalization of the banking sector and leading industries, that is to say, we have a national response in the face of a globalized world with all the numerous interdependencies that this entails and the capitalist class united and organized in a world level. So the, the alternative supported by Syriza uh, does not ignore the importance of the nation state and local struggles. On the contrary, it is happy to concede that the primary locus of struggle is within the nation state and against the bourgeois class of that stage. But it is also, uh, but we have to be aware of the importance of reaching out to secure alliances and promoting initiatives beyond the boundaries of the nation, the nation state. Uh, what is happening right now is such a thing. What will happen in Zagreb next week is such a thing. What will happen in Athens, like the other summit that you said before, it's uh, such a thing. Uh, so, another issue as well, which I think is important to, to mention, because there is a, a major threat from this strategy, uh, is uh, that uh, it seems that, that, there, is a, that there, uh, there, there is a great anxiety uh, to avoid uh, some kind of roots that history indicates which are easily encompassed by the forces of nationalism. Uh, the latter consideration is particularly indicative in the Greek context, uh, where the debt uh, default and euro exit option 
has been adopted by a wide range of nationalistic forces whose anti-imperialist rhetoric is not always easily distinguished, distinguished uh, from some certain sections of the left. Uh, that default is supported in this current because Greek does not owe anything to anybody. Actually, it is owed, and that is facing a new form uh, of occupation, a term that still has a powerful resonance in a country that has not forgotten its wartime experience, and uh, all that followed from that. So this line of reasoning, needless to say, it doesn't allow any internal division between the people and uh, the nation. So, in order to conclude, because as I said, so a few minutes, uh, what we think that is very crucial uh, in our strategy, it's not exiting from the Eurozone, but struggling uh, within the Eurozone by trying to shape, to form alliances uh, between the workers uh, the, the, I mean the, between the workers, not only to the peripheral countries, which is also important, but also with the workers in the core of the Eurozone. We heard before that in Germany uh, there is uh, the wages are very low, there is very big exploitation of German workers, and that uh, the export oriented economy of Germany is based on uh, cheap labor. Okay? So we need to form such an alliance, a solidarity front, we could name it, uh, which will have the power, which will gain the power uh, to try to change the balance of power uh, within the Eurozone. I'm sure that in the discussion, a lot of you will ask me, and uh, I, I want you to ask me, how possible is such a situation within the Eurozone? I mean, and uh, we will have plenty of time to <laughs> talk about that. Thank you to Gabriel for this uh, answer. Gabriel is also an economic uh, coordinator at uh, Syriza. And before we conclude this first round of discussion, does anyone of my co colleagues here at the table has a question or a comment for another of his colleagues? Okay, so now we begin with the second round of discussion, which is also open for you uh, in the stands. Uh, you can pose a question or you can pose uh, or you can present your comment. You just raise your hand and you will be given a microphone. <laughs> okay, here. Um, yes, I, I would think, agree with Luca that uh, coming to power of, of, of a radical left force would surely entail uh, a huge uh, fight back from the from the ruling classes of, of Europe, uh, but uh, I don't think that the question of exit of eurozone has actually been the the, the, the question in point. Actually, we've seen last year uh, uh, during the, the the election, well, actually prior to the elections in Greece, how the how the elites in in EU and both elites and and the media in EU and in Greece reacted. Uh, uh, towards towards Syriza was most openly not suggesting a, 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 a Brexit or an exit from from eurozone, uh, claiming that even that Earth would go out of orbit if if Syriza if, if Syriza gains power. So uh, I don't think that, that that this is basically the question. The question is of opposing the official uh, EU measures, uh, which are currently, of course, the, the austerity measures. Um, so uh, let's let's suppose that Syriza takes. Next, next elections, which we, I guess, all hope for. Uh, I, I think there, there would be two scenarios, both of which have been in, in action from the, from the uh, core EU zone uh, uh, country elites, which would be either to pressurize Syriza into uh, basically conforming to the, to the official uh, uh, Eurozone politics, or action to, to the austerity measures, or to try to get, to, to get rid of them, basically, and to, to replace them. From power, so I have two questions for flowing from this. One is uh, uh, about the relation of the party formation towards the the, 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 the social and working class movement, and how, uh, what is your strategy on defending uh, the, the, the the workers' power in power once once series uh, once series uh, gains elections, hopefully. And the other one is what is your strategy for the Balkans, which is uh, of course in that in that context. 
uh, which is, of course, the area, not just a geographical area, but an area where Greek finance and banking capital is, is most heavily uh, 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 contained, so, uh, which could also mean that, you know, uh, backing off or, or capital strike or banking capital strike would have deep effects on, on the other countries of the Balkans economies, and, and we all know uh, uh, from our pretty recent past how, how that ended up. So, uh, what is Syriza's strategy uh, in, 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 that, in that sense? Okay, I... I uh, have we gathered the questions? Yeah I, yeah, I propose that we gather uh, questions in bunches, three questions uh, at a time. So, does anyone else have a question? Yes? I also have a question for a Greek comrade. I'm sorry for the others, I'm not doing you justice, but I'm really interested in these two ones. Uh, first question is, uh, although you are really a strong power player in, Greek, in Greece, uh, however, there are also two at least left-leaning parties in Greece. One of them is uh, Democratic uh, Left, Liman, and uh, the other being the Orthodox Marxist uh, KKE Communist Party of, Greek, of Greece. Uh, so uh, the first question is, uh, I'm wondering whether uh, you see a perspective that you may combine forces with the other left-leaning forces. And the other question, which I think is also uh, very, very actual, is uh, how do we fight fascism? I mean, it's uh, the tendency, the fascist tendencies are in serious uprising in Greece. So I'm really wondering what are your strategies to, to combat fascism because uh, I'm sure that sooner or later the rest of Europe will also face these problems and already is facing the problems in some parts of Europe. Thank you. Okay. Uh, considering that we already have four very tough uh, questions and all, all are directed to Gabriel, I propose that uh, we already do this bunch. <laughs> Indeed, tough questions. Uh, first of all, uh, But the, the first question, uh, we, all, we, all, we all know that uh, uh, what's going to be the reaction, uh, not only of the, Euro, the Eurozone authorities, uh, if Syriza is elected uh, to government, but also of uh, the Greek capital, the Greek uh, media, uh, the Greek bankers and uh, the Greek ship owners. So we are prepared, we are getting prepared. You can never say that you are prepared in order to... Uh, defend uh, from such a big uh, uh, threat, uh, but uh, what we are doing actually is that we are, it's the thing that you said, we are trying to uh, forge alliances uh, among uh, various uh, social groups and uh, especially uh, with the labor movement. Uh, that was one of the elements of uh, our success in the previous elections. That, uh, for example, uh, due to the crisis and due to the social implications of the crisis, there was a, a major uh, break of strong ties between uh, PASOK, the Social Democrats, and uh, various social groups. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, public uh, employees, uh, medium, uh, small medium, uh, social uh, groups, and all this. And uh, what we did was we, that we were there and we tried to forge an alliance with all these people that felt suddenly that they were not re represented in the political system. Because that was very uh, scary. I mean, if you imagine that some groups feel like they don't have a political representation, then they turn against the political system. And there is a party to represent them against the political system, which is Golden Dome, the fascists, okay? So we did that, uh, we spent a lot of time in doing that. We, the, the, the good thing, our advantage was that uh, all the previous years, since the beginning of 2000s, even in the 90s, uh, we had very good, uh, a very good relationship with the social movements. We were participating in every uh, social movement that was developed, not only in the anti-global social movement, but also in social movements taking place within Greece, even if it was for local problems in neighborhoods, in towns, or it was for human rights, social rights, all these things. 
So people knew us already a lot, and we had very strong ties uh, with all this. Now that things are much more uh, challenging, the situation is much more challenging, uh, we pay a lot of uh, time and resources in order to, to be ready uh, to, to organize a defense from uh, the assault of all these uh, interests. And one of the things that we keep saying uh, everywhere is that uh, a government uh, from the, of the left uh, cannot do anything if it doesn't have the support of the people. It's uh, like uh, we, uh, we, we get our power uh, by the participation of the people. We don't want you to vote for us and then stay at your place in your home. We want you to vote for us and uh, be outside with us, participating and defending and criticizing, of course. So, uh, the other question was uh, tough, I have to say, about the strategy <coughs> of the Balkans. We know very well that uh, the big <coughs> banking uh, sector, we, which is one of uh, the, most of the uh, foreign direct investments, so has to do with green banking sector in the Balkans, uh, is uh, very, it's uh, in a very difficult situation right now. Uh, there was a, cap a recapitalization uh, by the European Stability Mechanism and uh, the thing was that although they needed uh, these funds in order to have the uh, capital adequacy ratio to, to be able to, to survive, uh, while this money uh, are a burden for the Greek public debt, which means that the, the Greek people pay for these banks, at the same time, the Greek uh, state does not get uh, the ownership of these banks. So what we say, this is one of our primary goals. We are talking about the nationalization of the banks that have received money from uh, this uh, recapitalization. So this is our strategy about the banking system. Uh, as far as it concerns what will happen uh, to all these investments, it's difficult to say. Uh, because uh, when you have such a fragile, a fragile uh, banking system in Greece, it's difficult to, to say that I will do that or this one in countries that uh, there are already investments. As I know right now, there are already uh, withdrawal investments from various countries. Uh, they are selling uh, their participations because they need money to, to raise their capital adequacy ratio. And uh, I, I, I cannot tell you something more specific because it's something technical that has to do with the fragility of uh, the banking system. Now, as far as it, as it concerns uh, the other two left parties, democratic left, first of all, we have to say is the party participating in the government, okay? And uh, the Communist Party has a very, uh, it's very sharp uh, towards us. They are very negative in any alliance with Syriza and they are criticize us a lot in the same way they criticize government. What they say in their public speech, in their public discourse is that uh, the government and Syriza are the two to same situations, only Syriza tries to be more uh, friendly to the workers, but it's only promises. So it's very difficult to cooperate with them, although we, we do want to cooperate with them, and although the people of the Communist Party, uh, the voters of the Communist Party, really want an alliance between Syriza and the Communist Party. On the other hand, the thing with the democratic left is uh, very difficult because for them, uh, because they are uh, criticizing us a lot uh, in terms of our policies, of course we criticize them a lot as well, but uh, because they participate in the government and they are supposed to be a left party. Uh, so we can say that uh, right now things are difficult in terms of alliances. However, we believe that as time will go, by, uh, things will change because the, the political uh, uh, 
situation in Greece is very fluid. So we may have new political parties, we may have new uh, balance of powers. And now, as far, the last question about how we fight fascism, uh, to be honest, we, at the beginning of the crisis, uh, we, were, we were not ready to, to fight fascism, because uh, what we were doing actually were some uh, spontaneous reactions, like organizing some uh, anti-demonstration when they had demonstrations or we were trying to solve this issue by you know physical violence sometimes to to defend uh, the space from the fascists and all this but as it seems it's not the most appropriate strategy to fight fascism because this kind of fascism is based on the social reality okay it's uh, the desperation of the people and the rage of the people from the political situation, that they don't see any hope out of the political system, that makes them to be aggressive and express their rage through parties uh, such as uh, Golden Dawn. It's not that all these people in Greece suddenly became fascists. If we admit that, we've made a very big mistake. So we have to confront the very causes that led these people to support Golden Dawn. And this causes is, first of all, the social situation, the implications of the crisis. It's the recession, the huge unemployment, huge unemployment, 27%, 59% unemployment for the youth. Can you imagine that? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. uh, I can imagine it also. And uh, so we have to deal with this social, with the social situation. And the other thing is you have to deal with the political system. I mean, uh, you have to be to be transparent in the political system. Uh, to uh, you have to prove that not all the political uh, parties uh, are uh, robbers and thieves. Okay. So you have to defend the political system uh, by various and more complicated ways. That's all. I almost talked us in my first intervention. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's fine. I mean, you gave very interesting uh, answers. And now I think Elizabeth has also something to add. Yes, it's on the question of the, on the extreme right of the fascism. Since in France you know that we have a long uh, experience with this. Uh, what is new in the last uh, uh, years that this kind of uh, extreme right develops a new kind of what they call social discourse. They say that uh, uh, if you want to have uh, social protection, you have to merit this. So it's a f they finish with the idea of solidarity, of human rights, of social rights, of democratic rights, and so on. So you have to merit uh, to be helped uh, if you need it, uh, and uh, so you have to be part of the, co the good community. Uh, so uh, to be friends or to be uh, to, to accept uh, to, to 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 be um, to, to to come together in a certain way and so on. So uh, and this is uh, of course a kind of, of very important division uh, between the, the people. They say uh, that uh, that uh, migrants and uh, parasites, uh, parasite, how do they this? Uh, parasites? Yes, uh, they are the enemies of the society. But the parasites are not only uh, the, the migrants, it's also French people. Uh, uh, they don't, uh, workloss people and so on. So they, they, they give a kind of feeling to the not completely poor people that they can be defended facing the parasites and so on. So it's a new kind of division and of course in this context of crisis uh, it can work because uh, people they are working very hardly have the impression that they have to pay to, for, the, for the very poor people and it's not uh, justified. And so it's, it's, they block completely class struggle because uh, the, the division is between the poor and the not completely poor people. And it's not against the very rich and the, the, very, uh, the capital side and so on. So, and of course it's very difficult to find strategies to fight against since you don't have to help them to give the impression that they are anti-systemic forces. So if you make this kind of struggles to, to fight the uh, manifestation, counter-manifestation and so on, 
you, in a, in a certain way, you help them to give the impression that they are against the system. And it's, it's not so easy, but I think it's very interesting what is done in, in, in a very positive way in Greece. It's the, the kind of conception you have from solidarity for all. And, uh, you know, the, there is a very, very important and, and, uh, humanitarian uh, problem of health in Greece now, because uh, a lot of people cannot go to the hospitals and so on. So there are uh, social dis center, social centers, self-organized social centers with uh, self uh, with, with uh, volunteer uh, uh, doctors and so on, and 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 this is a kind of solidarity for everybody, and and the, the solidarity replaces the the state who is falling down, and and this is, I think an important way, and so since in France we created a solidarity campaign to, uh, and, and and collective with this. And so I think we have to do things like this in order to to make it possible that the people are abundant and you are you are uh, what you say nobody has uh, does uh, uh, stay alone in this crisis. I think this is very important. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I just have to remind you that I'm sitting here not only with the very exhausted uh, uh, Gabriel but also with four other uh, <laughs> very interesting persons from interesting environments, so they too deserve your attention. Uh, and now for another batch of questions, I think Marco is... is, is. Uh, so I will follow your advice and go to Germany for a while. Uh, so a question for uh, Christina, you mentioned these three obstacles. Uh, economic in the ideological sense of articulating the left position. So from that, that perspective, what you think what are your predictions about the next elections for, uh, in September for the for the Linke and also about this very probable uh, big coalition of uh, CDU, CDU and the SPD and will that uh, bring more maneuver space for the Linke to articulate much more uh, uh, much uh, to articulate these problems in much more uh, socially, politically persistent manner. Do you want me to answer that? No, no, no. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I totally <laughs> forgot that my function is here to moderate. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, I think you said that you have also another question. Yeah, right? I have a, well, I, was, I, was, I would like to raise some questions for the discussion, um, but I don't, you know, um, because I was, um, <laughs> do I have to hold it? <laughs> um, um, well, I, I would like to, to uh, um, like have a discussion or an, or an exchange on the question on what do we fight for in Europe? Because I think we've been talking about institutions a little bit, what, what kind of space do they open up or don't they open up? But I'm, I'm, when I was uh, here yesterday morning, we had this, uh, in the morning session there was this chart about the left Keynesian demands and I felt a little bit caught because I said, fuck, they're all on our agenda. <laughs> but, but then, you know, tax the rich, um, uh, raise wages for the, um, have more invest, uh, investments, investments, sorry. Um, so but then, of course, we have, uh, luckily, we have the other demands like transforming how investments are decided, how they are formed, uh, transforming economy and, and democratize economy, um, downsizing the banking sector. But still, I think it, it's an interesting question of what, what would be demands or what would be goals for a European fight that we could come together around. Um, and uh, that would make sense as well. That would not only, because as I said, uh, the, the, there has been, have been a lot of investments into the Eurozone from Europe, from other countries. There's the, um, the unions are calling for this huge investment program, but I don't think it's that clear that that will, be, that, that will make a difference. So how do we ensure that this is not another opening up markets, direct investments, and restructuring the market in favor of the German export sector, but as in the contrary, really pushes in some direction that we would favor, or questions like how can we uh, 
democratize the discussion about debt, like is there a possibility for a debt audit that would not only open the discussion of what is just debt, you know, what is a, a legitimate um, uh, debt and what do we not pay back, um, but as well involve more people in the process and bring a democratizing, a democratizing um, aspect to bring together movements and parties and a, and a political discourse to get out of this ground where we have protests that are mainly not represented in most of the parliaments and um, and we're not sure if that's not a good thing. Um, and on the other hand, so we, we have this, this delinking of, of this, uh, of this um, um, different uh, political actions or the, uh, branches. So that would be my questions for the discussion. So. Yeah, I think you, you can also use this. Yeah. Uh, my prediction for the elections. <laughs> uh, well, the polls for the link, uh, we, we had 11.9% uh, in the elections of 2009, and I'm pretty sure we won't get that again, because that was very much driven by the, um, uh, by the uh, outrage uh, about crisis management. Um, and there was a common discourse that obviously there's something wrong with capitalism during that time in 2009. This has, as I try to sketch out a little bit, this has shifted a little bit. Um, the polls at the moment are between <coughs> six, seven, eight, nine percent, you never know. Uh, but that would be okay. I mean, we had this process of um, almost killing the party by internal discourse and fights and war uh, over the last, like, a year ago. And, it, and it's very hard to come back into a public discussion after that because people see you as um, see the party as wrapped up in, the, in itself and its and its own problems and people don't trust that you know it's like who's who's up for representing my interests if they are if they keep beating up each other so so that's very hard to come back from um, the situation for the election at the moment is that there doesn't seem to be a possibility for an SPD. Uh, Green government, the Greens and Social Democrats, because they're just not up. The, as the Social Democrats just don't get the numbers at the moment because they, and in part because they elected a leader that is basically uh, jumping from one uh, mishap to the other. Um, the party itself tries to um, rhetorically move to the left, but that doesn't fit with the candidate they elected because he is very much representative of the crisis management of NATO. He, Draw, draw it out with work together. So, um, so they don't get out of, of their 23 to 27 estimates, so that won't make it make the barrier. Um, CDU, SPD would uh, be good for us in that sense that we don't have the problem of people thinking, oh, the social democrats sound left again, so maybe I go back there. Because a lot of, of voters of the left party move there because of the neoliberalization of the social democrats. And it might seem to a couple of them that um, the social democrats might be back uh, in, the, in the left field. So if they join the CDU, this problem would be over. But I think it's a hard price to think. But on the other hand, I mean, I don't, I, from the experience of social democrats and green government, sketching out and seeing through all these work to regime um, reforms between 2000 and 2004, I mean, you don't know what what to wish for. It's like, I don't want to. Thank you, Christina. And now, uh, is anyone uh, prepared to uh, uh, answer to Christina question or batch of questions? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, however, one word to the idea of exiting the, uh, the Euro. Uh, I uh, actually there are, I have a threefold personality regarding this. One is a coordinator of a, a European structure. Uh, in case uh, one of the countries decided democratically that uh, they opted for leaving the euro, I think the left has to respect this decision and has to fight for the most favorable conditions um, that it could be uh, done. We must never allow to break uh, our comradely and, and, and solidarity relations. This is 
one aspect. The second aspect is as an economist. As an economist, I would say it's, well, allow me to say this, but I think it's voodoo economy. Namely, uh, there is no, no single example where um, devaluation ever has contributed to the redistributions of income and wealth within a given society. I remember very well the 70s when I was a young guy studying economist. Uh, the, the game was Italy, it was always the same. In autumn, the trade unions uh, had big strike movements, managed to achieve higher wages, and in the next spring, the government devaluated the lira in order to get back some of the gains which the working class has achieved through the strikes. And actually, the idea to think that you can raise the living standard by devaluating is creating the illusion that whole societies are sitting in one boat and if they enhance the competitivity of their respective economies all together, we are a national community. In this case, then things uh, become better. And the third uh, uh, approach to the question is my personal approach as an Austrian. In Austria, the question of leaving the Euro is forwarded by the extreme nationalist right. They say, let's get rid of the southerners. They live on our expenses. They are lazy. They are incapable. Let's kick them out. And if the left in a country like Austria would surrender to this argumentation, I think it would be disastrous. Disastrous under, under all conditions. So even the question of uh, splitting up the Eurozone differs in that what it means according to the place where you raise the question. Nationalists always use the same grammar and the same language, but actually they mean always different things. The Greek nationalists mean that Greece maybe uh, healed or maybe saved, while the Austrian nationalists mean Austria should be prevalent. That's why they are nationalists. This is one, one thing which I wanted to, to say in this discussion. The second thing refers now to, to the question which uh, Christina uh, uh, put forward. Well, actually, uh, I think it's a paradoxical situation we um, uh, out there, uh, outside uh, the Europe Memorandum, and which is uh, a joint declaration and analysis of 300 eminent uh, European economists. And uh, well, you find here the whole left Keynesian agenda, you find it completed by the idea that we have to transcend it, go beyond it, uh, have to aim at another way of uh, development mode. Uh, it deals about restructuring the financial sector, redefining the role of the European Central Bank, uh, enhancing the uh, public services, um, investing in ecological restructuring, very important, redistributing income and wealth. All these things, I would say, are pretty well designed and pretty well thought through. We may, we may differ when it comes to weighing the different aspects, but, but we should be able to convert and to agree on next step. But the real difficult thing is that all these good ideas confront in itself a logic which is at the moment the logic of the elites, of the most of the national governments, of the European institutions, and of the majority uh, in the European Parliament. And I think without trying to be too synthesistic, but we have to understand that we are in a severe and fierce power struggle. And the question is not only to have fantasies and visions of how Europe could be developed better than it is, because this is not easy, but there are certain ideas regarding this. The real problem is to develop a strategy how to lead this power struggle. And this has to do with disobedience, 
This has to do with alliances. This has to do with the possibility that in one or the other country, left governments may come into power. And about our capacity to combine all these forces, to defeat the prevailing policies, and to open the space and open the way for an alternative policy based on a different historical block and based on a different balance of power. And this, that's why I think um, it is so important that we keep our solidarity, that we keep our structures, that we are able to develop a joint policy and a joint strategy uh, in, in, in this struggle. Uh, thank you. Is anyone else have to answer uh, Christina's question? I think it is also addressed here. Uh, yes, Good afternoon. Good evening. I would like to just take the opportunity to thank the organizers of this event for allowing me to hang around. I am not European. So, and I should have meddled in domestic affairs because of my occupation, which is not my profession. As a profession, I am a professional comrade. And so I would like to allow myself then this opportunity to express the solidarity of many other comrades on the other side of the Atlantic uh, with the struggles that the peoples of Europe are starting to wage in order to survive. I have promised myself that when I will come back home, I will open some sort of solidarity campaign for Europe. <laughs> <laughs> years ago it used to be the other way around. You know, we had in France and Paris the Cuban Solidarity Campaign, the Chilean Solidarity Campaign, and in the 50s, 68, in May the 68 there were even the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign with the guerrillas that were fighting in Venezuela. Uh, so but I think it's time to pay back. Uh, definitely uh, you know as an observer of the from from that distance see a few things that sometimes, you know, are kind of skipped by, by some European countries. You know, for instance, this grammar that has been also instilled in very leftist countries, you know, that seems to be stuck with this terminology and in the architecture of power that has been developed in Europe. I would like to salute the idea of, of Syriza not leaving the Eurozone or the, of the European Union. As a comrade, I was taught, and I was taught that you never leave the battlefield. I mean, you never yield, you never let it be. You must stay there and transform. That is why we are called Marxists, some sort of Marxists, that, you know, we were asked to believe in the possibility of transforming things. So, how about a revolution <laughs> as a solution to the many problems you are faced with? that seem to be very complicated, as complicated as that camera that is now filming. You know, it's complicated. Complicated things, these things that we can pull apart and they put together again and probably they can work. I feel that the problem is more complex than complicated. It has to deal with people. I really regret to hear that, you know, the link for the next election will have less vote. I hope it won't. I want to keep optimistic. But as I, and I ask you to keep optimism because this is probably what is happening in Europe. Recently, the discourse, the official discourse in Europe, it moves from hope to terror. You know, if you don't do this, if you don't apply these measures, you will see an apocalypse. And then you got some European workers also selling hope because they need hope, people to feel hope, to have hope in the European institutions. Otherwise, they won't get their nice salaries in Europe by bureaucratizing everything and making things even harder for people. I have told this to several comrades here in Ljubljana, but I, I would like to tell this anecdote. 29 years ago, probably 22 years ago, when Fidel Castro was visiting Venezuela <laughs> for the inauguration of the very neoliberal president that. Uh, four weeks after the inauguration, applied the first time in history the f uh, an austerity package, and that led to 3,000 people getting killed in the streets protest in one day. 
And Fidel Castro told us, you know, he wanted to meet with the young people, with the young revolutionary people from all the myriad of parties and movements that were in Venezuela. People who didn't like to talk to each other, who had, oh, this is a revision, you know, this is a trust piece. But, you know, we kept, on, we kept on pointing fingers at each other in those days. And he started the session with this phrase. Dear comrades, first of all, I would like to congratulate you all on your infinite, on your endless capacity to keep this united. Because in this fashion, you have prevented the peoples of Latin America and Venezuela particularly from having a, a socialist alternative, a socialist option. And I think that we understood the message. You know, I say this for many other Slovenian comrades, but also for all the other Europe, uh, left forces in Europe, you know, talking about keeping the solidarity that we got now, etc., etc., etc. It's a little bit sad. I would say, please, uh, broaden this solidarity. You need to enforce, to reinforce, to strengthen this solidarity, because it's certainly a class struggle. I don't know if we should keep on talking about neoliberalism in Europe. I got the impression that this is heading forward uh, and straight forward to feudalism. It is almost feudalism that you are just about to face. Uh, probably, yes, but some sort of bondage. So I think that the only alternative, it's the only alternative you know, is to deny and, 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 you know, strive for really, uh, you know, producing some sort of revolution because what is happening in Europe is unheard of. Someone is only, uh, someone before uh, was talking, I mean, uh, Mrs. Uh, Comrade Christie. Christina. Christina was talking about the evictions, the amount of evictions in Spain. Well, that is just half of the story. Because when people are evicted from their homes in Spain, they still have to pay the debt to the banks. I mean, this is a horror movie. And it is urgent. It is a matter of urgency that all the European leftist movements without any uh, uh, complex whatsoever come to, to, to broker a deal about you know, yes, a revolution, call it that way, you know, don't be afraid of calling it a revolution, of calling it a workers' revolution in, in, in Europe, particularly because the working class is nowadays faced with the terrible situation of having no workplaces. And this was not a question, it is just my solidarity message to this afternoon. Thank you. for his comment and I think we have time for one more uh, batch of questions. I think uh, a hand was raised. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, I want to pose a question to uh, uh, Luca Messitz, an eventually representative of Germany. Uh, it considers the crisis of uh, neo-mercantilism in Europe in general. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, uh, to say certain things about the history of the uh, European uh, Union, but uh, also, as, uh, also uh, about the installation of the uh, European Monetary Union and the exchange rate mechanisms in which uh, Germany uh, was very involved. The, the big role of the Germanies in, uh, lies on the implementation of this mechanism. Since the lira could dance, uh, I don't know, uh, during the 60s, but, but uh, the currency and the question of fixed rate mechanism uh, prevent lira to dance and prevent certain, a certain structure of a power. To what extent uh, the course of European Union uh, is connected with these past institutions, European Monetary Union and exchange rate mechanisms? And uh, since we know that uh, the history of European Union is exclusively economic project, how can we politicize uh, uh, the question? Uh, the question of, let's say, that we could. Uh, in Germany, uh, gain the power or enter into the parliament. What uh, what will be the measures which will politicize this economy and the lack of uh, redistribution mechanism inside of the eurozone? 
and the autonomy, of course, of the fiscal policy. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question and then we will have to conclude uh, because I, our time is... Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question potentially for everybody. I wonder, based on your previous experience, what forms of organizing do you find most interpolative for new people? And when I say interpolative, I don't mean getting new voters, I don't mean people to pay membership fees for the party, I mean people to cooperate in your uh, projects and organizations. Now, I'm pretty sure it's not obscuring these debates about Kronstadt. I'm uh, skeptical whether uh, reading seminars on value theory are also enough, but I wonder what else, according to your previous experience, whether is it strike organizing, practical projects, or anything else. Thank you. And now, I think uh, Luca was the one the first one addressed. Okay, um, maybe to answer this one about uh, European Union as purely economic project, I would <coughs> put it otherwise. I think that uh, it's a neoliberal project, and neoliberalism always represents itself as a political ideology. It's like, uh, as in uh, nation states, it always. Uh, <coughs> argues that what is needed are not politicians, we have to give more power to expertise. And it is uh, that kind of trick it is doing uh, with the European Union. Actually, the, the um, directions, uh, directives that uh, nation states or member states are receiving from Brussels are more or less all uh, um, in more uh, um, political and uh, neoliberal color, but they, they, tr they kind of um, translate as European technocracy constructed them, but it's not technocracy, I mean that technocracy is uh, strictly ideological and, he and uh, behind this uh, technocratic um, mask uh, there hides the, the interest of ruling capitalist elites in Europe. So I think that we must uh, expose the uh, European Union uh, in particular as neoliberal project uh, uh, since uh, 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 um, today, but I mean, I mean uh, <laughs> uh, since its beginnings, and um, uh, maybe about I didn't quite understand uh, the the question about uh, the how. If I understand correctly, your answer is uh, your question is how the um, the currency the uh, of euro is related to. Uh, uh, imperialist politics of uh, mercantilist politics of Germany is that the question? Uh, I think it was even before the euro because after the dissolution of Bretton Woods, uh, uh, Deutsche Mark kind of became of uh, anchor currency in Europe, and uh, almost uh, uh, every uh, each currency was bound to, to Deutsche Mark. So euro, euro in uh, this sense is some kind of continuation of uh, post Bretton Woods uh, currency regime in Europe. In Europe, but um, uh, I think that if we uh, pose Germany as the core in Europe, it is. Uh, um, we have to, to seek its origins uh, in this um, period after the dissolution of uh, Bretton Woods and after Germany. Are the exchange rate mechanism established during the 60s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank I didn't get it really. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't get. Uh, uh, I didn't understand the question. Sorry. For acoustical reasons, can you repeat it if you want a reaction? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask what will be eventually the measures uh, in case that you gain the power and um, now. Uh, Germany or whatever country of a, of a center in Europe will be in order to politicize this purely economic me mechanism and to establish redistribution and relative autonomy of a fiscal policy. Um, well, I'm not that sure about the relative autonomy of the fiscal policy, but I think the rest I can answer, at least what our plans would be. I mean, it's always... Um, rather easy to sketch out your plans when you're that far away from the but, but it's, um, so, 
uh, on the redistribution point, we have um, uh, taxation and uh, remodeling of the, of the economy. Um, we have the classic tax the rich program that is uh, supposed to um, be spread over Europe. So we, we don't have this tax evasion uh, ideas. The European left has come up with a um, property levy um, well, through over, through, <laughs> for all over Europe to, um, to address uh, those who have cost and gain, cost the prices and gain value and um, pull them into the responsibility for um, taking up the costs of the crisis. Um, there's a um, there's a concept for you know readdressing this question of low wage market in Germany and um, and then this austerity poverty wages now being uh, addressed in, in the rest of Europe. Um, we're trying to come up with concepts of having like social corridors. Uh, how how can we how can we come up with common standards that are not not an immediate uh, like it's the same everything everywhere else. So so we um, we avoid a rush to the bottom. That uh, the common standard would be the, the the lowest standard in Europe. But how can we come up with a concept of um, like harmonizing to the to the bigger standards, things like that. Um, that of course includes um, um, re um, redistributing the financial or resketching the financial sector. I'm not really sure if I should go into detail of these things because it's like more of a demands list. But it, but there's a, as a, there's an idea of that. Um, there's a problem in, in the discussion about um, uh, in several leftists, but especially in the German leftist uh, movement that is kind of um, in an impasse between the one fractions that are um, very cautious of the critique of Europe. Um, and the others who are um, calling for going back to national um, realm of fights and struggles because that's the only place where you can gain something and we're trying to come up with a concept to bring those together but there's a lot of fight to go uh, around this other part. I would like, if I may, um, address Nestor's um, uh, emotional um, solidarity note, um, although I, th I don't think it's time for that. <laughs> But it's um, but I was a little bit um, ambivalent about your hope thing because uh, I was just a couple of days in a discussion where people were talking about the current the euro as a currency and saying that there are more and more people are losing trust in the currency and that the trust is um, uh, that there comes in hope now and the only guarantee for hope at the moment in German into the euro euro currency is Angela Merkel so that's kind of a more um, not so. Uh, optimistic way of talking about that hope, and I think we need some like directions where people don't need to hope for things. But I'm, I'm sure you didn't mean that. I, I was just um, uh, that was just um, connecting with that. And I think um, I think it's important, um, a little bit like Luca said, that it's, it's we're not talking about feudalism. It's authoritarian neoliberalism. It's getting ready. Possibly, I would say it's getting ready in the Euro free trade zone for a competition with other free trade zones. Uh, who has called for competition with China and other regions in the uh, in the globe? That is not so much um, into these detail questions. You know, I, I feel like they are getting ready the EU for a concept of uh, you know we as a EU. There might be poor and deindustrialized areas, but we as the EU comp compete with others, and there are the poor areas as well. And now, how how do we deal with that? Things like that. So I think that's a um, that's a very modern neoliberal global competition concept, and that's and feudalism seems to be almost cozy <laughs> in comparison to that. Um, for the organizing question and a little bit linked to the eviction question, I think there there's one point for hope in that because people are not only asked to pay for their evictions, but it's getting difficult with the evictions because police and the locksmiths are starting to strike every now and then and are not going through with the evictions. And I think that is basically where our hope and our own organizing efforts should lie, although I wouldn't say that the left party is at the forefront of this concept, but, but I think that that's the perspective of uh, what we need to do. We need to, um, to 
come up with concepts of everyday struggle and link them, and consolidate them in structures that are per more permanent um, and they are, that are able to reflect about the experiences in these everyday struggles and how to move forward. Because normally, you know, you, you enter these everyday struggles, then you get exhausted. You have to keep your somehow your daily routine up, and then you just say, okay, nothing matters anywhere. So I, I just go back and um, organize my everyday life. So I think that is that is the concept that we need to elaborate a little bit on. And um, Gramsci has this very interesting word of the societal party, um, uh, which means that the societal party is part, is part of the resistance, I would say, that has the potential for hegemony. It's not necessarily, I mean, it's, my, my, well, it, there should be a party in it, but as well, it's unions, it's uh, protests, it's um, social actors, even <coughs> maybe actors who explicitly deny being a party can be part of the societal party. And I think we need to move into these kinds of images. How can we form um, a block that has the possibility for hegemony with these different branches of um, institutions and, uh, and forms? Um, Hillary, Wayne, Hillary Wainwright, the editor of um, uh, Pepper, Red Pepper, had a very nice image for, you probably know it for Syriza, which I, which I think is something uh, very, uh, similar that she says, Syriza is like a swarm that is starting, so it looks maj majestic and very, very calm on the upside, but then there's all this paddling of the feet down below. And I think um, we're so much used to watching the swan flying, and, um, and at least those of us who are, who are uh, into party politics are not so much um, into this evolving, these paddling with the feet, and I think this is what will uh, what will open up some kind of possibilities for government. Uh, thank you to Christina. And now to move on to the second question by Dragan. Is anyone up to that? Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, well, your question was related actually of uh, how it's possible for an organization of young people to approach uh, other young people outside uh, the organization. Which I think it's a question uh, that uh, uh, is in the mind of all the people who, who have been participated in youth organizations in all countries. So what I think that we are doing here, if you want my personal view, uh, from my experience in the last two days that I have uh, participated in this event, I think it's very interesting and very important. And uh, it's really uh, important to talk about theory, to talk about uh, Marxism, socialism, the necessity of socialism in uh, uh, the present times. And, uh, yeah, and uh, there is, of course, a target group in people, especially in the universities of higher intellectual level, of higher education level, uh, that you can uh, approach uh, by these uh, conferences. However, you, I'm sure that you all understand uh, that uh, it's only these people uh, that you will approach through this uh, strategy. And uh, in, in my point of view and from my experience in Greece, uh, the most important uh, way in order to approach uh, the young people is to try to find uh, ways in order to become uh, useful to them, to find uh, th these uh, problems uh, that they have, they encounter, problems in everyday life or problems that are very, very much related to the political situation. For example, what's going on in the, in the universities, if you, I, I'm sorry I don't know what is the situation here in Slovenia, but for example, if you have, if you're paying tuition, if uh, you have private public universities, how do you defend the public character of the university? I don't even know, I'm repeating what is the situation. And uh, try to find ways to become useful to them and uh, try to, uh, to answer to the very basic uh, needs that they have. And 
also try to uh, take into account uh, what will make these people uh, satisfied from their participation. I mean, what they will gain, not in material terms, of course, but what they will gain through this participation. Try to, uh, to make them feel that uh, they are really participating and they can see the outcome of their participation in such an organization. Uh, these things, I believe, are very important and sometimes uh, the youth organizations underestimate uh, such aspects. And uh, yes, and of course, uh, uh, all the things that you said, I mean, to try to approach uh, working people outside the, the universities, uh, in the factories, in the squares, all these things are very important. I try to link the problems of the young people with what's going on in the central, central political level. Uh, is anyone else? Uh, does anyone else? Okay. It's a general remark because uh, we had in Europe uh, now uh, very interesting uh, experiences with indignados and this kind of, of movements and uh, take the squares and so on. So there was a very high uh, mobilization of youth, uh, of young people. In the same time, it's not a, a permanent movement. So it puts a lot of question uh, to everybody of us uh, how to how to deal with this uh, in the recognizing the capacity and the necessity and the possibility for such of uh, mobilizations and what are the, the reasons for this. In the same time, how to 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 build a more permanent uh, strategy with this, or how to help that these kind of movements uh, become real factors, not only for the public opinion but also for the balance of forces. And this is a very difficult question because uh, we have to deal at uh, the same time with a very important disappointment with the political structures. So when the general political, try, uh, what I tried to, to say before, uh, that we have a, a political crisis in Europe in the parliamentary systems and, and so on, and, and the political parties, they are part of this. Uh, and the left try to make the distinctions, but uh, it's not it's not easy to do it. So I think that we are only in the beginning of, of, of trying to invent new kind of forms. So I think that every political party today has to 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 invent uh, new forms of, of, of uh, democracy. Uh, so the, the vertical strategy is impossible. You need to have horizontal uh, ways to communicate, to decide, to to, to build. Uh, to elaborate things and so on. So it's a, I think that, that to build an alternative and to force for alternatives and to, 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 to really uh, build uh, something for, for not only uh, one moment, but for, for, a longer, for a longer strategy, uh, this needs to reinvent also the political forces, the political parties. And just an experience from France, uh, we feel there is a kind of uh, articulation between you need local initiatives, very uh, citizen initiatives, uh, uh, self-organized, things like this. But at the same time, things like this can only uh, uh, have, uh, how to say, uh, grow and, 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 uh, and, and be more durable. Yes, <laughs> if there is a national perspective in the same way, in the same time. So when we when we had the campaign uh, for the last elections with uh, the Front de Gauche, the fact that we had citizen assemblies with uh, open uh, op as open spaces, this really uh, uh, brought important uh, mobilizations. But in the same time, it was needed that it was a national campaign making sense for everybody and making credible the effort of everybody. So it's a kind of, of necessary articulation between the, the local uh, energy and, 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 and the ways of, of inventing uh, uh, um, f new political forms and at the same time a political common uh, uh, aim. So I think this is important and just I wouldn't uh, leave this room uh, without uh, calling you to, to go to the Alta Summit or to try to, to, to be part of this. Uh, there are different ways to be part of the Alta Summit. 
uh, you can uh, create uh, local uh, or national coordinations. You can look for the for the um, uh, page for the internet international web uh, for the net net site uh, web <laughs> sorry for the website in different languages. Uh, you can try to make delegations. You can try to restitute what will happen there with videos and so on. So I think that it is the first step for a kind of uh, common European uh, elaboration of an alternative uh, manifesto and, and for new alliances. Everybody was speaking on this. So I think uh, I would really call for, for this. Okay, and now Walter for the fish. I want to come back to your question, provided that I understood it correctly. Um, I think, as Luca said, it, the neoliberal project of the European Union never was a purely economic project. It was always a social and a cultural project. The idea of creating a common market beyond national regulation and national democratic influencing was a project which transformed, which was a part of transforming the societies in a neoliberal way. Now this project is in crisis and we see mainly two reactions on the part of the ruling class. One reaction is what uh, Christina pointed out, authoritarian neoliberalism may be by completing, transforming the European Union in that what they think that the political union is, with competitive pact, fiscal pact, and so on and so forth, force, or by muddling through and uh, applying the austerity measures case to case that we see nowadays. But at the same time, and this is, in my opinion, uh, a new aspect of the development, we see the coming up, of a different conception within the ruling elites, namely a nationalist option. Restructuring the relations in Europe on the basis of competing nationalisms. And you can now see within the left, among the left, that certain parts of the left try somehow to accommodate with one or the other um, tendency in the, in the the dominant discourse. If, for example, Daniel Compendent, who recently published this book, was hosted, what he mainly says is, let's go through the political union, the social union does not exist, but once we have the political union, we can take the decision to go for a social union. We have the other uh, uh, reaction by some uh, leftists to say, well, we were 50 years ago, we were in favor of the monetary union. Unfortunately, the toy did not work as we imagined before. Let's get rid of it. And the question for me is, is the left capable to define its own independent political project in the European scale? And this involves a social, economical, ecological, uh, societal, feminist dimension, but it also, of course, uh, has a political dimension, and provided that uh, Europe will not be a unified nation-state, because uh, it is not one nation uh, in Europe, how can a democratic, participatory, political power can be structured? I would say on the basis of sovereignty of the populations, on the basis of, of subsidiarity. It implies the strengthening of the uh, parliamentary powers in relation to the executive powers, may it be the powers on the nation state, may it be the powers on the uh, European level. We must abandon the practice that European institutions as the European Central Bank or the European Court of Justice replace law-giving institutions we must introduce um, accountability and public control on all of these levels. And I understand that this is difficult because this is the politicization of something which is not yet politicized. However, if the left is capable to forward such a project, I think that would be a part of a hegemonic uh, strategy on the European level and as well on the level of the nation states.
Uh, thank you, Walter. And with this, we have to conclude because we are our, 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 our time is up uh, 20, or 20 minutes ago. Uh, yeah, not yours. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Thank you to my colleagues here, up, up here, and for, thank you for all the participants at our uh, this year's uh, media school, both uh, the ones which participate from up here and for ones for, uh, which participate from uh, the stands. And I also thank in the name of the Bukas Pax University to Bunker and Rosa Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, which enabled uh, this conference to happen. And see you in the next uh, revolution. Thank you.